Did you ever stop to wonder about the origins of the most famous symbols on the planet? If you consider the hieroglyphics and structures in Egypt are of completely different time periods altogether, then you must seriously contemplate the real timeline of history. There are obelisks and monuments, stela and temple walls that are covered with ancient hieroglyphics that suggest to us that the dynastic Egyptians built the ancient structures and covered them in hieroglyphics, but there are three problems with this theory. One being that the dynastic era don't claim that they built the Giza Plateau with the exception of repairs as immortalized on the dream stela of the Great Sphinx. The second problem is that hieroglyphics are clearly a much later addition to the ancient monuments. And the third problem is that the Great Pyramid is dating well before the emergence of this civilization. Before the discovery of the Rosetta Stone, we had very little clue as to how to translate the cipher that is hieroglyphics. The Rosetta Stone is engraved in Greek and Egyptian symbology. Through our understanding of Greek, we are able to come up with the translation of Egyptian symbols that is still key to this day in translating the ancient text. It must be said, however, that the Greeks changed their alphabet in 800 BC and the markings on the Rosetta Stone are dating to 196 BC. This means these translations are from the very latter period of the dynastic period of Egypt and earlier inscriptions may not be very accurate when using the more modern Rosetta decipher. What this stone is, is a list of accomplishments from the late Ptolemaic period issued at Memphis Though it is unclear what happened to this artifact or how it became discarded in such a disrespectful manner, one can only conclude that if Napoleon's officers had not uncovered this piece during the construction of a wall, then we would still be wondering what all the markings was all about in the region. It does make you wonder that if the Greeks had such a close relation with Egypt, then why is there not more documentary evidence from the ancient Greeks. There is something that is not adding up and you have to wonder how was the knowledge almost completely lost as to read the ancient text. Wait till you hear this. Attempts at deciphering Egyptian hieroglyphics were made by Arab historians in medieval Egypt during the 9th and 10th centuries. By then hieroglyphics had long been forgotten in Egypt and were replaced by the Coptic and Arabic alphabets. You have to wonder when and why they stopped using these glyphs and why they were seemingly almost completely forgotten despite the fact that there are hundreds of thousands and maybe even millions of texts in Egypt in hieroglyphic form. The Egyptian hieroglyphic script was one of the writing systems used by ancient Egyptians to represent their language. Because of their particular elegance, Herodotus and other important Greeks believed the Egyptian hieroglyphics were something sacred, so they referred to them as holy writing. Therefore, the word hieroglyph comes from the Greek hiero, meaning holy, and glypho, meaning writing. So the Greeks, these symbols meant holy writing. In the ancient Egyptian language, hieroglyphs were also called the God's words and it was believed that this writing was an invention of the gods and attribute the invention of these texts to the god Thoth. Archaeological discoveries suggest that hieroglyphs may be the oldest form of intelligent writing anywhere in the world. The earliest evidence of an Egyptian hieroglyphic system is believed to be dating from 3300 or 3200 BC and they used the writing system for the next 3,500 years. The first known example of this type of writing in Egypt was discovered on bone and ivory tags, pottery vessels, and clay seal impressions discovered in pre-dynastic tomb in Abydos and dated to 3,400 years BC. Thoth is the Egyptian god of writing, magic, wisdom, and the moon. He was one of the most important gods of ancient Egypt, 
alternately said to be self-created or born of the seed of Haras and from the forehead of Set. Worship of Thoth began in Lower Egypt in the pre-dynastic period and continued through the Ptolemaic period which marked the last dynastic era of Egyptian history and marking Thoth's veneration as among the longest of the Egyptian gods or any deity from any civilization. In 3150 BC, the first dynasty appeared in Egypt with the unification of Upper and Lower Egypt by the King Menes, who incidentally is now believed to be Namir. Regardless, he is depicted on inscriptions wearing the two crowns of Egypt, signifying unification, and his reign was thought to be in accordance with the will of the gods. However, the office of the king itself was not associated with the divine until later. Like most ancient scripts, the origin of Egyptian hieroglyphs is poorly understood. There are, however, several theories that have been put forth over the years, with the most convincing theory being that of the art of envisioning visual imagery. However, during the Ptolemaic and Roman period in Egypt, Greek and Roman culture became increasingly influential. Towards the second century, Christianity started to displace some of the traditional Egyptian cults. And this is reflected when the Byzantine Emperor Theodosius I, when he closed all pagan temples throughout the empire. This action terminated a 4,000 year old tradition and the message of the ancient Egyptian language was lost for 1,500 years. It was not until the discovery of the Rosetta Stone and the decipher of Jean-Franco Champollion that the ancient Egyptians awoke from their long slumber. Today, by virtue of the vast quantity of their literature, we know more about dynastic Egyptian society than most other ancient cultures. However, just like our understanding of anything else from ancient times, the decipher may be flawed as the Greek alphabet was changed and this would suggest that earlier hieroglyphics from before 800 years BC, when the change was implemented, are probably inaccurate to a certain degree, and some texts could be completely misrepresented altogether. The first dynasty of Egypt covers the first series of Egyptian kings to rule over a unified Egypt. It immediately follows the unification of Upper and Lower Egypt. The date of this period is subject to scholarly debate, about the Egyptian chronology. It falls within the early Bronze Age and is variously estimated to have been anywhere between the 34th and 30th century BC. The historical records of Egypt incredibly begin with Egypt as a unified state. The historical records of ancient Egypt began with Egypt as a unified state. According to Egyptian tradition, Menes thought to have unified Upper and Lower Egypt was the first king. The Egyptian culture and social structure was closely tied to religion, remarkably stable, and changed little over a period of 3,000 years. Egyptian chronology, which involves regional years, began around this time. The conventional chronology was accepted during the 20th century, but it does not include any of the major revision proposals that also have been made in that time. Even within a single work, archaeologists often offer several possible dates or even several whole chronologies as possibilities. Prior to the unification of Egypt, the land was settled with autonomous villages. With the early dynasties and for much of Egypt's history thereafter, the country came to be known as the Two Lands. The pharaohs established a national administration and appointed royal governors. According to Mantheo, the first pharaoh was Menes, but archaeological findings support the view that the first ruler to claim to have united the two lands was Namir, the final king of the Nakata the Third Period. Nakata the Third Period is the last phase of the Nakata culture of ancient Egyptian prehistory. It is the period during which the process of state formation was installed. It is a little bit strange that there is very little sign of civilized culture before the unification of Egypt. You would think that there would be a whole struggle spanning thousands of years to even arrive at the point of unification. Leading to much speculation surrounding the separate origins of the Giza Plateau and other monuments in Egypt. 
which are dating way past the period of history and may even have stood here well in existence at the very beginning of dynastic Egyptian history. If so, you are talking upwards of 10, 20, or even hundred thousands of years before this civilization used their hieroglyphics to scrawl over the enigmatic designs that are found in this region. Thoth created the written word people use to record their history and keep track of their daily lives. According to some stories, Thoth invented the word and gave it to humanity, while in others, Thoth was the creator of his consort Shashat, gave words to the people. In other variations, Thoth was the creator, but Osiris or Isis gave words to humanity. In every case, Thoth is the creator of written language and the literary arts both for humans and the gods. The very fact there are reliefs of this god makes one wonder if Thoth was present to the dynastic Egyptians or if these people had uncovered much more ancient text credited to the god and that hieroglyphics are derived from the more ancient and advanced symbols. Thoth appears regularly at the side of Osiris and Anubis in the Hall of Truth as the scribe who has kept accounts of the life of the soul of the deceased and who records the outcome of the weighing of the heart against the feather of truth. All known accounts of history are all pointing out the same thing, that civilization emerged just before the unification of Egypt, and the culture then seemingly began using hieroglyphics, which was the language of the gods, suggesting that these symbols were not invented by the Egyptians of this time, but that the style of documentation was long in existence from a much more ancient culture. They then derive this form of writing and cover the walls and passageways with the text in an effort to document the earlier, more ancient history of Egypt, the time of the gods nonetheless. That's all for the moment, guys. You can let us know what you are thinking. And as always, thank you for watching. Hey guys, this is Buzz Weaver, the voice of the Lost History Channel and A Light of the Dark. And I wanted to take a moment to recognize all the support you guys have given to both the Lost History Channel and Light Up the Dark. Your contributions through Patreon and purchasing some of the merchandise that we have here on our channels is greatly appreciated. I can't emphasize enough how much your engagement with the channels has helped us along the way. There is a lot that goes on behind the scenes as YouTube creators, and sometimes it feels like we as creators are working uphill or against the current. With ever-changing rules, policies, terms of service, compliances, and other things, and now Article 13 and Article 11 for our UK and European creators like the Lost History Channel and Light Up the Dark, these challenges seem to always be growing. We are very happy that you guys have been here all along to help support our efforts, and I wanted to personally thank you guys. I also would like to welcome you guys to my channel, the Buzz Weaver channel. Yes. I'm the voice of the Lost History Channel and Light Up the Dark. However, we are two separate creators. I see that quite often in comments asking if this content uh, for the Lost History Channel and Light Up the Dark is mine. It is not. I simply have the great privilege, privilege of voicing it for you guys. I'm always encouraged by your guys' support for us both as we try to bring you guys great content and engaging topics.